Let me begin by asking you a question. Do you want what's best? Louder. Do you want what's best? Now, I've discovered something. There are different kinds of what's best. Have you tried looking at a dictionary and, and to find out how they define best? You'll be amazed. It doesn't really give you a lot. It talks about most desirable, most excellent. You see, best is a comparative word. There are different kinds of what's best. For example, what the world can offer. For some people, that's the only thing they understand because they have not been trained to see the other side. What can the world offer us? For many people, what the best the world can offer will be what? Popularity? Position? Power? Possessions? For them, that is their best. There's a problem only. It has been proven from history and observation that people who are very successful in the world, many of them still commit suicide. So that cannot be the best. For some people, the best is what you think in your mind will give you the highest happiness. You, you are sincere. In your mind, you think this is the best. But do you discover, have you discovered what's best for you in your mind may not be really what's best for you? Let me repeat. What you think is best may not really be the best. I remember this girl. She was very honest. She really was enamored with this guy. She was dreaming, thinking, I will be married to this guy. In her mind, this guy is the best. But I praise God. When I evaluated the guy, by the grace of God, listen to me now. All the pastors here, by the way, we are your advisor when it comes to your love life. We will not command you, but we will give you our opinion. That guy is amazing. Good looking. Money. Good family. Good education. Humanly speaking, the guy is good. But you know, this girl is amazing. She prayed about it. And the Lord brought up an issue. Why they should why that relationship is not going to work. It has to do with her love for Jesus. It has to do with her faith. She will not compromise her faith. Praise God. This girl discovered not too late, early enough, that her best is not God's best. Today, she is happily married. I'm sharing this with you because you need to understand what do I mean by best? Do you want the best? All right, I will now qualify it. I want to offer to you God's best. Do you want God's best for you? Those who don't say yes, perhaps you need to go to the hospital <laughs> and have a mental checkup. If you are normal, you will really want God's best because God's best is really the best for you. But you may not always see it that way. Why are we discussing this? Because for the next three weeks, our new series, next three weeks, is Christmas Unwrap. Because Christmas is what God wants you to have, God's best. You will learn how to experience God's best. So we start with Mary and Joseph. Next week, we will discuss another character. And then the last Sunday, would you believe it? Christmas is on December 25. It's going to be a Sunday. By the way, I don't worship December 25, okay? I will tell you right now. We don't exactly know when the actual date of the birth of Jesus. However, for the sake of making it an opportunity for everybody to celebrate Christmas, they decided right now it is December 25. You go to other parts of the world, the Eastern Orthodox Church, they have another date. But what excites me is this. I'm really excited. You can now bring your friend. Do you know some people go to church three times in their life? Three times a year, three times. Christmas, Holy Week, 
<laughs> the third one, bahala ka na, whatever, okay? Perhaps when they are sick and they are about to die, they may want to go to church, okay? But my advice to you is this. You try to invite people to come on Christmas. Most, many of them will come. And then you include something. When you come, tell them, I will give you food. Okay, it's called, I don't want to call it uh, evangelical, I call it food legal. You know, Filipinos, we love to eat, amen? All right, so December 25, by the grace of God, pray for me, I will still be alive, and I will give you a Christmas message, okay? Christmas unwrapped. Today, what will we discuss? Very simple. What can you learn about experiencing God's best in the life of Mary and Joseph? Are you ready? Okay. <clears throat> Let's begin. Three important realities you can learn from Joseph and Mary, especially when it comes to realizing God's best. Okay, I will give you a mental outline. Number one, you must realize God's grace. So, if you want God's best from the life of Mary and Joseph, these are something I will highlight. There are many things I will discuss, but these are something I want to highlight. God's grace. You have to realize God's grace. Number two, you must respond in faith and obedience. Remember that song we sang? Trust and obey. Yep. There's no other way. You want God's best? Trust and obey. Respond. Number three, you have to rejoice in God and His Word. If you rejoice in circumstances, it's going to be very temporal. So let's begin. Let's look at, by the grace of God now, let's begin with... Now, I want you to look at Luke chapter 1. Let's begin. God's grace. Everybody, if you don't mind, can you read with me? All right, together. One more time. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. If you want to invent a new religion, if you want to invent Christianity, you will never begin by a story that is unbelievable. You see, Christmas story is historical. It's real. It cannot be invented by men. Because why would you begin with a story of a virgin birth? It has never been accomplished in the past, and it will not be accomplished in the future, because this is a unique situation. But here is the story. By the way, have you read Gabriel? How many of you, your name is Gabi, Gabriel? Raise your hand. Okay, I'm so glad, but you are not an angel, but... <laughs> Gab Gabriel, you will see Gabriel in the book of Daniel. Gabriel is a special angel that stands before God. He delivers God's messages. We have another angel. What is his name? Michael. Michael is the archangel. Do you know of another name of an angel? Okay. Satan. But that is a bad one, okay? Of course, my friend is pointing to himself. He said, I am an angel. I better check with your wife, brother. All right. Let's continue reading. Now, this is the story of the first Christmas. Understand? We will unpack it. Coming in, he said to her, everybody read, Greetings, favored one. Now, when you look at your English Bible, you don't appreciate really the root word for that. The root word for favor is charis. It's grace. That's the word for grace, charis. The Lord is with you. Grace is so amazing. It is God with us. It's unmerited favor. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation is this? The angel said to her, everybody read. Do not be afraid. Mary, literally, the name is Miriam. 
in Hebrew, Maryam. Now English, Mary. For you have found favor, charis, with God. The first thing you need to understand is you must realize God's best is anchored on His grace. It is something undeserving. Do you want to know how that word grace is used in the Bible? I want to comfort you to realize grace is not given to just a few. It is God's heart to give you His best. What do I mean? Let's look at how that word grace is used in the Bible. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. Let's read together. For by grace, charis, you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Notice, even grace is a gift. Not as a result of works that no one may boast. Faith, grace, they all go together. It's a gift from God. Salvation is God's gift. Have you experienced God's grace? Can I tell you how that word is used? Grace? I will show you another verse so that you will appreciate God wants His best. Everybody look at me. You must realize in your heart that God wants His best for you. Can you tell your neighbor with conviction, God wants what's best for you? Tell your neighbor, God wants what's best for you. Satan is saying, no, no, no. God does not know what's best for you. You have to be on the lookout. You have to do it your way. You know what is your way? Have you heard me sing the Frank Sinatra song? I did it my way. My friend, my friend, my way is not always the best way. But most of us today are brainwashed by the world. You want it your way. Husband and wife, you know why you have a problem? The husband wants his way, the wife wants her way. You know why children have problems with parents? Because you insist your way is better. You know why people fight with each other? It's all about self-centeredness. My way, my way. But I've discovered something. My way may not always be the right way. That's why you need grace. Look at how that word is used. Titus chapter 2, together, together. For the grace, charis, of God. Grace comes from God. Has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Notice this grace refers to Jesus. God's best is Jesus. But how is that word used? What is grace? In, grace will instruct us, not just salvation. It will teach you how to live. Instructing us to deny ungodliness, to say no to sin, and worldly desires. Do you realize your desire has to be changed by God? I cannot change my own desire. I can try, I can try. But I need God's grace. The earlier you discover that today, the more you will go into your knees and pray, Lord, change my heart. And that has been my prayer. And I realize only God can change the desire of anybody. I cannot change people's desire. I cannot change anybody. When I counsel people, when I help people, I always tell them, look, I cannot change you. But I will share with you the Bible, but you need to pray. That's grace. Instructing us to deny ungodliness, worldly desires, everybody read, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So what is grace? Grace is not just something undeserved. Here is a simple definition of grace. Grace, everybody read now, is the power, is the desire. Everybody read together. Just read together. Grace is the desire and power God gives us to what? To do His will. Friends, do you need God's grace? I do. I need the grace of God to change my desire and to give me the power to do what God wants me to do. Without God's grace, I'm going to be self-centered. I'm going to be selfish. Do you want God's grace? Once you realize God's grace is from Him and He wants to give that to you, you'll begin to connect. God wants really what's best for me. 
And that's why you need to realize the grace of God. The uniqueness of Christianity compared to all other religions is the grace of God. All other religions is you need to earn salvation. You need to do it on your own. Only in Christianity will you discover it's all of God. His grace. You know, by the grace of God, He offers us amazing opportunities. Ricky, talk about God's grace. Remember what happened to the Apostle Paul? Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's what Paul is saying, by the grace of God, I, have, I am what I am, because of grace. However, there are barriers to grace. How can you stop God's grace from your life? And do you know what it is? I want to make sure you don't fall guilty of this problem. To prevent God's grace in your life, you just be proud. To be proud is to stop the grace of God from entering your life. What's my proof? Look at the Bible. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility. Humility is the secret of experiencing God's grace. You say, Lord, I need you. I'm dependent upon you. Clothe yourself. Clothe yourself. It's a fashion term. You know, when you wear something, you want, in a fashion show, the objective is for people to admire the clothes. The command is clothe yourselves. Put on humility so that others will see the humility that's in you. Now, when you put on humility, you don't put a sign. Okay? I'm so humble. I'm so proud of it. No, no, no. You, to be humble is not to draw attention to yourself. You draw attention to others and to Jesus. How can you tell if you are humble or not? How? There are many ways, okay? Listen to our other messages. But right now, just look at yourself. If you are full of self, always thinking about yourself, always critical of others, always judging others, friends, in all possibility, you are full of pride. You see, proud people react when they are criticized. When they are corrected, they become angry. Proud people will never assume responsibility. They always blame others. That's why you won't receive grace. You want grace? Let's read this together. Everybody, God is opposed to the proud. But, louder, louder, gives grace. To who? Louder. To the humble. So, do you mind asking your neighbor? Just look at them and say, am I humble? Ask them. Am I humble? Now, if your neighbor is quiet, you are in trouble, okay? That's okay. No problem, all right? Now, let's continue reading. So, grace, the grace of God. Realize God's grace and don't prevent God's grace in your life. You want God's best? Louder. You want God's best? Realize God's grace is given to the humble. Next, let's continue reading. Luke chapter 131. Behold, now, God is now telling Mary what's going to happen. Eight things. Eight things. God told Mary what's going to happen. Number one, you will conceive in your womb. Number two, you will bear a son. Number three, you shall call him Jesus. By the way, Jesus means what? Yahweh is my Savior. God is my Savior. You will call him Jesus. He is your Savior. Next, he will be great. Next, he will be called the Son of the Most High. The word the Most High is a reference to God. In the Chinese language, if you see ancient Chinese literature, they refer to God as Sang Ti, the highest, the most high. Nobody is higher than God. That's what the Bible is saying. He will be son of the most high. Next, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father. In other words, he will be a king. He will sit on the throne of his father. These are all prophetic. Next, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. This king is going to be unique. Look at history. Look at all dictators. They come, they go. They come, they go. 
one of the most powerful dictators in the world, Kublai Khan, Genghis Khan. They come, they go. But this king is different forever. And lastly, his kingdom will have no end. Friends, I don't know about you. When this was announced to Mary, can you guess what was in her mind? This is all prophetic. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7 tells us. Everybody read together. A child will be born to us. A son will be given. The government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will look at the name. Huh. Wonderful counselor. Meaning super IQ. Wonderful counselor. Mighty God. Eternal Father. Prince of Peace. If you want to know whether... Christianity is real in this particular denomination, in this particular sect. Ask them what they think of Jesus. Let me repeat. Many people claim to be Christians, right? How will you know if their Christianity is biblical? It's a proper view of who Jesus is. Jesus is not just a man. He is God who became a man. That is important for you to know. Everybody read. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Do you belong to God's kingdom? Is Jesus your Lord? Better make sure. Because his kingdom will have no end. Life on earth is not final. The Bible tells us you and I will reign with Jesus forever and ever. Christianity do not just look at the present life. God's best is not just now. It's for eternity. And you have no idea what God has in mind for his people. Now, when Mary heard this, can you tell me what went through her mind? Well, let's find out. I appreciate Mary. Scholars tell us by this time she was probably around 14 to 16 years old. Here was a teenager. Given the most amazing revelation. And look at what she said. Everybody read. Mary said to the angel, Everybody, how can this be? Since I am a virgin. Literally, in your Greek Bible, it says... I have not known a man. I have not known a man. That's the meaning of, I'm a virgin. How can that be? So how will you answer that question? How can a virgin get pregnant? Can you, do you want to know the answer? I'm so glad. Luke is the author. Luke is a doctor. So he knows medicine. He knows science. But the answer it's amazingly simple. The angel answered and said to her, everybody read, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High, God the Father, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. That word overshadow means you'll be surrounded and God. God is going to do it. Wow. It's all supernatural. And for that reason, the holy child shall be called the Son of God. Wow. And then, God knows what Mary was thinking. You see, God always affirms our faith. He helps you to believe if you are sincere. And here is the confirmation. God told Mary, behold, even your relative Elizabeth, her cousin, has also conceived and a, son, and a son in her old age. You see, Elizabeth was old already. Impossible to conceive. Not only that, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. In other words, something impossible already happened to your cousin. Do you understand? Elizabeth was not only old. She was barren. What is barren in Tagalog? To you. Maliba? Barren. 
Baob. Baob. What is that? Any, any other Tagalog word? Okay. As long as we understand each other. Barren means baob. You cannot have a baby. So medically speaking, there's no way. What did God do? By the way, those of you who want children, feel free to ask us to pray for you. Okay? I don't, I'm not telling you my gift is praying for mother to get pregnant. Okay? But one thing I know, all my children are very productive. Okay? <laughs> and uh, pregnancy is a gift from God. Amen? So I'm sad when some mothers do not want to have children. Because children is a gift of God. You bring immortality to the world. But because of our wrong thinking, in fairness, many of you have been brainwashed. We focus on selfishness. We focus on what's comfortable for us. And we fail to realize when you have children, it's one of the greatest gifts you can have to your child. Immortality. Coming to know Jesus. Let's continue reading. You know, Mary, when she heard about her cousin, ah, if God can do that to my cousin, God can do it to me. But the angel did not stop there. The angel said, everybody read. This should be your memory verse. Okay? Today, read. For nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, do you believe that nothing is impossible with God? Louder. Do you have problems? I have. Just recently, I have problems. From the trivial to the big ones. But they are all problems, which I cannot solve. One of them is my eyeglasses. Now, this is a true story. I could not find my eyeglasses. So, I called my office. Can you check? We came from Anvaya with the leadership retreat. Can you check CCF office? I look at my office in the house. I look at my room in the house. I could not find it for four days. So I decided I'm going to go to uh, an optical store to have this kind of eyeglasses. This is very special. You know why? I discovered this one, you can step on it, and it will not break. So it, it, it's nice, very light. And then the Lord reminded me, nothing is impossible. So what I did, I prayed. Now, I realize there are many kinds of prayer. One kind of prayer, you just pray casually because you need to pray. Another one is you pray from the heart. When you pray from the heart, you really are serious. And I was dead serious. I said, Lord, I know you know where is my eyeglass. I know you know, but I do not know. Will you help me find it? Please, Lord, I ask you. And then my quiet time has always been, according to your faith, be it unto you. So I believe. Okay, Lord, I believe. Would you believe it? The next day, after coming from CCF, I went to my house, and I saw this pair on my table. So I asked the house help. I said, please come, please come. Where did you find this? Sir, I saw this pair, of, because I asked everybody to look. In fact, I'm offering a reward. If you can find my eyeglasses. You know, this pair of eyeglasses, she said, was seated on top of this computer. Now, I've been moving the computer. I bring it to CCF. I've been using it. I said, how can it be on top of the computer? Somebody made a joke. Multo, multo. <laughs> but you know what? God said, you see? Honestly, to this day, I have no explanation. In our house, the one that can find lost things, the number one is my wife. I told my wife, honey, since you have the gift of looking for things, can you help me look? The nada. She tried everything. But you know what? Is God amazing or not? Can you see? I'm so happy I don't have to go to an optical shop and have a new pair. However, I have more serious problem than that. So you see, I try to resolve two leaders. They are not talking to each other. And to me, that's hard. But can I tell you something? God reminded me. Nothing is 
Impossible. That's it. So I prayed again. I prayed. All I'm trying to tell you is this. Guys, you want God's best for you? All right. You've got to respond. You've got to respond in faith and obedience. If there's no faith, there's no obedience. Do you know obedience has its foundation because you trust God? Look at what Mary did. This is the most amazing statement. Nothing is impossible with God. Look at what Mary did. After knowing nothing is impossible with God, everybody read now, behold the bond slave of the Lord. Mary is now saying, I am a doulos. The word bond slave is not ordinary servant. It's a bad translation when you have the word servant. It is literally a bond slave. I am a slave. A slave has no free time. A slave has no break. A slave is completely owned by the master. And that's what Mary is saying. I am the slave. I'm the slave of the Lord. Therefore, everybody read, therefore, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. What was the angel doing? The angel God is giving Mary a chance to respond you see, God wants to do supernatural things in your life and my life. In this case, God did not force his will upon Mary. Mary said, okay, be done to me. What about you? Do you know what God wants you to do? See, many times we don't. We don't respond to God. We want it our way. Do you know for Mary to say yes to God, what is implied? the risk of her life. She could be killed. Huh. Why do you say that, Peter? Let me show you from the Bible. Look at Deuteronomy. Everybody read this. If you accuse a virgin or somebody to be married of pregnancy, this is what's going to happen. Remember, in the Bible, in the Jewish culture, when you are engaged, you are like married. Engaged people are basically married. The only way you can break the engagement is to have a divorce. Why? Because the Jewish culture is such that engagement is a picture of how God is going to deal with us. Do you know that? I can give a message on that another time. In the meantime, I want you to know engagement takes time. The family discuss with each other, then they pay a price. For the family of the bride. And it's accepted and they are engaged. Why is that period long? Because the man prepares a place for the family. And that period, usually one year, that period, or we do not know how long, is a time for testing whether the girl and the man will be faithful to each other. It's time of testing. The only difference is this. Engagement you don't consummate the sex. You wait. But everything else is like mere married. All right? Are we clear? For Mary to say, yes, I don't mind becoming pregnant. What is she saying? I don't mind if I lose my life. I don't mind if I'm ridiculed. I don't mind if I'm humiliated. And I do not mind. Should Joseph divorce me? I do not mind when I'll be embarrassed for the rest of my life. I do not mind if I am rejected by society and I'll be, a, I'll, I'll be a poor person. You know why? Why did she say yes? You must respond in faith. And to respond in faith is to obey. I remember a leader was counseling a couple. They were fighting. And this leader was telling the wife, the man was counseling the guy, and usually, they, you know, hi guys, if you have marital problems, you are not alone. Okay? Almost every couple I've met, they go through struggles, problems. Well, this family is having problems. So the counselor told her, this is what you need to do. But that girl was stubborn. The guy was willing to do his part, but this particular wife was very stubborn. And finally, this counselor, God gave her wisdom. You know why she is not obeying? Faith. 
And then the girl got mad. Are you accusing me? I don't have faith. Are you accusing me? By the grace of God, the counselor was loving and firm. You know, to believe and not to obey is not yet to believe. Say that with me. To believe and not to obey is not yet to believe. You cannot say you believe and you don't obey. You see, obedience and faith, they go together. So look at your life. Are you responding in faith and obedience? Let's continue. By, by the way, did I finish reading this verse or not yet? Okay, read fast. This is what Mary had to go through, okay? The Bible tells us what will happen to her. They will bring her out of the doorway and they will stone her to death. Because she has committed an act of folly in Israel by playing the harlot in her father's house, you shall purge the evil from among you. So to be pregnant while engaged, if you read the next verses, 22, 23, it talks about engaged couple and you are pregnant the penalty is death. So that is the implication for Mary. Continue reading. Without everybody read now, why it is so important to respond in faith? Everybody together. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. He who comes to God must believe. God is. Nothing is impossible with him, but he is a rewarder to those who seek Him. Do you know why people don't seek after God? Why you don't have a hunger for God? Because you have been brainwashed, lied to by Satan. That God is really not after your happiness. That's why most people don't seek after God. That's why you don't obey Him. Ask yourself, what is it that God wants you to do and you know it and you are not obeying it? Like paying taxes, living a holy life, asking for forgiveness. What is it? Let me tell you, at the end, your unbelief. Why will you not submit to one another? Ladies, if you're not submitting to your husband, listen to me. Is it because of fear that he will take advantage of you? Possible. Husband, what's preventing you from asking forgiveness from your wife or treating her nicely? Do your part. You see, the whole point is this. We are always afraid of what may happen. Most of us disobey God because we are afraid of what may happen. You don't realize obedience is usually costly. It is costly to obey God. But can I tell you something? It is more costly not to obey God. You will not know the blessings that you have missed. See, you see, obe say that with me. Obedience brings blessing. One more time. Obedience brings blessing. Blessings. Blessing to yourself, blessing to your children, blessing to your family, and blessing to the people around you. Disobedience, believe it or not, brings curse. You will be cursed, your children will be affected, the people around you will be affected. That's why the Bible tells us, choose you today. You want blessing or curse? What do you want? Louder. Well, how do you do it? Realize it's the grace of God. Humble yourself. Number two, you must respond in faith and obedience. Look at Mary. You know, I really appreciate this young girl. At this time, Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country, to a city of Judah, entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth, her cousin. Why? She wanted to be confirmed that what he said is true. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. By the way, that's why I am never in favor of abortion. I'm never in favor of killing the baby. You know why? A baby, there is life. In this case, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Read the next verse. She cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you, women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. How is it, 
happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me. For behold, everyone read, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. Huh, six months old baby can hear. Amazing. I don't know how to explain that. Read, blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. In other words, you are blessed if you believe what God is saying. Amen? Praise God. Do you believe in God's promises to you? You better, because God will never lie. And you know what happened? Do you recall when Jesus was preaching and people said, Blessed is the breast that nurtured you. What did Jesus say? Uh -uh. Jesus said, blessed is everyone who hears my word and obey. You want to be blessed? All right. Hear and obey. Now read. Because of this, look at Mary. Rejoice in God and His Word. You know what? You want God's best? You will end up, if you trust and obey, you end up rejoicing. Let's read this together. Mary said, now this is the famous Magnificat. Have you heard of that term, Magnificat? That's from the Latin word, magnify. Here, Mary is worshiping God. Here, Mary is praising God. Rejoicing in God. Let's look at her theology. Many people don't realize a young girl like Mary, 14, 16 years old, can know the Bible. Everything she's saying is a quotation from the Old Testament. Mary knew the Bible. You see, it's hard for you to know God and be happy about God if you don't study the Bible. You want God's best? Study the Bible. Memorize the Scriptures. Get to know God through the Bible. How many of you have read the entire Bible now? From beginning to end. Raise your hands. Higher. You have read the entire Bible from beginning to end. Higher, higher, higher. I want this photograph, okay? Higher, higher, higher. I'm looking at some of you. Now, my question to those people who claim to follow Jesus. Why have you not read the entire Bible? My family, my wife and I, we encourage you. So I've read the Bible countless times. You know why? That's how I get to know God. That's how I get to know God's will. How will I obey if I do not know God's will? Think about it. How will you know what to obey if you do not know God's will? How will you know God's best? Remember Romans chapter 12, verse 2? Do you want to see that verse one more time? Romans 12, verse 2. How will you know God's best? All right, I'll show you. you got to know God's word. You know why? It says here, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got to change the way you think so that, everybody, you may prove, you may experience what the will of God is. What is the will of God? It is good, acceptable, and perfect. God's gift is perfect. It's best for you, but you need to know His Word. Friends, do not deceive yourself into thinking you can grow spiritually without studying the Bible. Do not create your own religion nor invent God in your image. Many of you are thinking of God is like this, God is like that. It's your own imagination. You must submit the way you think to the Word of God. Look at the song of Mary. Look at her poem. Amazing. My soul exalts the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Notice the object of her joy. God, God. It's internal. Rejoicing in God, the worship of God is from the heart. Wow! He has regard for the humble state of his bond slave. You see, when you learn from Scripture, when you learn about God, you learn to see yourself. Mary saw herself. I'm a slave. Not proud. You learn to see yourself. Most of us do not know who we really are in the eyes of God. Full of pride. We are so entitled. Not Mary. Everybody read. I love this. Behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. She is now applying God's word in the Old Testament to her life. 
These are all future tense, but it's written in past tense. Huh. It's called predictive prophecy. Read the next verse. It is so sure that the future events is now considered past tense. She interchanged the past and the present and the future. But it's all from the Bible. I love this verse. Look at her song. Look at her theology. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Personalized. Have you experienced God's mighty deeds in your life? Louder. Yes. Those of you who have not, it's hard for you really to worship God, to be rejoicing. Because you have not encountered the Lord. Then let me tell you why you have not encountered the Lord. Because you have been compromising all your life. You don't give God a chance to prove himself real in your life. You must be willing to obey God no matter what the consequences is. And then you ask God, Lord, suicide it all. I remember a family. When the son took over the business, he told the father, we're going to pay taxes. And the father said, huh? we will go bankrupt. The father told me. I said, what happened? Well, the son kept paying taxes by the grace of God. This company is top, inside the top 10 in the Philippines. But because the son was willing to walk by faith and trust God by doing right and leave the consequences to God. You see, God's best may not happen immediately, but sooner or later it will happen. Look at what Mary said. God has done great things for, louder, for who? Louder. The mighty one has done great things for, oh, what about you guys? You see, God wants a personal relationship with you. His mercy, look at the description of God, okay? For number one, Mary understood God to be mighty. Number two, holy. And number three, merciful. His mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear Him. He has done mighty deeds with His arms. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. Continue reading. He has brought down rulers from the thrones. He has exalted those who are humble. Notice, these are still past but future tense. When Jesus comes again, he will reverse the order of society. You will be shocked. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant. Future tense. In remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, Abraham and his descendants forever. Mary is claiming God's promise to Abraham, what he will do someday. Can you see the secret of God's best? You must rejoice in God, who he is, what he has done, and what he will do for you. Friends, if you are sad, you are having problems, I ask you to readjust your mind. You now focus on God, his word, who he is, what he has done for you, and what he will do for you in the future. And that, my friend, gives me tremendous joy. Because God's best is not always now. Mary and Joseph did not fully understand what's going to happen. But can I tell you something? Later on in their lives, they realized, oh, wow, the privilege of becoming the instrument where God will come on this earth. And would you believe it? They have no idea what their lives will do to you and to me. You know, God's best is amazing. Wow. What about Joseph? Are we going to forget Joseph or shall we talk about Joseph? Okay, I'll tell you about Joseph, okay, very quickly. I hope this will encourage you. But before I jump to Joseph, I want you to help to read a quotation from W. Tozer. Salvation apart from the obedience. Everybody read. Together. Salvation apart from obedience is unknown in the sacred scriptures. Apart from obedience, there can be no salvation. For salvation without obedience is a self-contradictory impossibility. Why am I preaching this? Because I've seen many churches today all over the world, they preach shallow Christianity, assuring people of salvation without a real encounter with Jesus. And my job is to make sure 
that I teach you properly and I don't deceive you into thinking you are going to heaven, but you are not. You see, grace is never by works, but grace will always involve works. So when you refuse to obey God, example, God asks you to forgive somebody. Look what I'm trying to do with this leader. I'm making them talk to each other. Many times it's really hard. You don't want to talk to each other. But can I tell you why these leaders will talk to each other? Because they know Jesus. Friends, you need to learn to obey. If not, you won't experience God's best. What happened to Joseph? Let's read. The birth of Jesus was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, engaged, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Remember that story? In other words, they were engaged already, and then when Mary went to visit that place, remember, God appeared to Mary, got her permission. Remember, Mary said, be done to me. God could have forced his way, but God gave Mary a chance to say yes to him. Now, people ask me, what if Mary said no? Oh, how will you answer that? Well, one thing I'm sure of. God's purpose will be accomplished. It may not be Mary. It may be another person. But God's purpose will be accomplished. So what will happen if Mary did not say yes? In Tagalog, I won't go. <laughs> what, the Bible is not clear? We leave it at that. But one thing I'm sure, God is always waiting for you to say yes to him. And this is what happened. Look at the consequences. My goodness. Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away discreetly. You know, secretly, you know, I admire Joseph because Joseph is a product of God's grace. To be righteous, you need God's grace. To act in graciousness, you need grace. Joseph was gracious. You know, many times you want to do God's will. May I suggest do the right thing, but also the right way. Don't do the right thing the wrong way. Joseph wanted to do the right thing the right way. She did not want to embarrass Mary. She, he could have announced to the whole world, Mary, this girl, immoral, unfaithful. I am divorcing her. No, he wanted it secretly. I admire Joseph, a man of character and kind. But you know what happened to Joseph? Read the next verse. <coughs> Together, please read. When he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. By the way, if you are Joseph, listen to me, and your engaged girlfriend told you, honey, I don't know how to explain to you. <clears throat> I am pregnant. Now, you are Joseph. You ask your girlfriend, how did you become pregnant? Honey, I really don't know. The angel said, I will be pregnant. If you are Joseph, what will you do? <coughs> be honest. Do you see, Joseph did not believe her. He wanted to divorce her. But he wanted to do it nicely. But I realize God's grace at the right time, never too early, at the right time. When he was about to divorce her, the angel appeared. Everybody read? <coughs> Together, one more time. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. The child who has been conceived is of the Holy Spirit. Everybody read. She will bear a son. Number one. Number two, you shall call his name Jesus. Joseph had no choice. The son called his name Jesus. What else? He will save his people from their sins. Even the mission of Jesus was given to the Father. This is his job description. He will be a savior. You see, you want God's best? Trust and obey. What did Joseph do? 
Read the next verse. Now, <coughs> the angel mentioned biblical prophecy, and the author, Matthew, wrote the following. Everybody read. All this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. You see, Christmas was not invented by man. Long ago, God thought of Christmas already. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us, God's best. Isaiah chapter 7. This is a repetition of the Old Testament. Everybody read this together. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Christmas is God's best. God wants what's best for you in your life. Like Mary and Joseph, did you know for them to experience God's best for their life, they need to know the grace of God. They need to also realize not only God's grace, they must respond in faith and obedience. Their focus is God. What did Joseph do? As we finish, let's read. Joseph awoke from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. Notice, kept her a virgin. In other words, when they got married together, Joseph did not have sex with her. Until, you look at the grammar, until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Did you know that Jesus had brothers and sisters? Let me show you. Matthew himself wrote the following. You see, this is the problem. When Jesus came to his hometown and teach them in their synagogue, they were astonished. Where did this man get his wisdom and these miraculous powers? Now, look at their conclusion. Look at their problem. Is this not the carpenter's son, son of Joseph? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, Jude, and his sisters, are they not with us? Where then did this man get all these things? They took offense of Jesus. So my friend, Jesus became a man 2,000 years ago. But before he became a man, he has always been God. Understand? The virgin birth is crucial because it is to prove to us that Jesus was no ordinary man. That's why in John chapter 1, verse 1, everybody read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. Apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Who is the word in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Who is the word? How do you know? Well, look at verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus, God, has always existed. In time, eternity. But Jesus, the man, took place 2,000 years ago. And what's so amazing was Joseph is always obeying God. If you read the story of Joseph, God always appears to Joseph, and Joseph is the one who is obeying. For example, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph. Get out of this place. Herod will kill. Go to Egypt. Joseph obeyed. Matthew chapter 2, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph. Now Herod is dead. Go back from Egypt, go back to Israel. Joseph obeyed. Then when he went to Israel, the angel said, Ah, don't stay here. Stay in Nazareth. Go to the, Gen go to the regions of the Gentiles. And Joseph did. What can you learn about Joseph? Joseph was the leader of the family, and he obeyed God step by step. As we close, I want you to hear the story of our pastor, it so happens, his name is also Joseph. All right? But I want you to notice his obedience, how he experienced God's best in his life. Let's close with this testimony. 
Good day, everyone. I bring you greetings from the Mindanao region and Cebu, where I am tasked to oversee. I am Joseph C. Bayawa, the regional pastor of the Mindanao region of 13 satellites, 9 in North Mindanao and 4 in South Mindanao and Cebu. Based on in two cities, Cagayan-Dioro City and Cebu City, married to my ever-supportive and loving wife, Feli, we have four grown children, all married, one boy, three girls, and four grandchildren. My wife and I are both civil engineers. We worked in Manila for 26 years before we heeded a call to go full-time. My wife came to know the Lord ahead of me through a Bible study in her office in Makati. I came to know the Lord through a Bible study in AAM in 1988. We joined CCF in 1989 and attended every leadership training available. Within three months, we joined a cell group. Presently, we call this a discipleship group or D-group. And in 1991, we started our own cell group. By the grace of God, our cell group grew to seven cell groups and a total of about 80 members. In year 2000, by God's grace, we were privileged to plant a CCF church in Cebu City. We accepted the challenge with peace and joy in our hearts. We were commissioned by our elders sometime in the first quarter of year 2000. And in May 2000, we went to Cebu bringing along our youngest daughter, Melissa, who was to enter first year high school at the time. Our third child, Grace, voluntarily joined us in 2002 after finishing college in Manila. CCF Cebu was officially declared a satellite in October 2000. The years that followed were very exciting and extremely challenging. While we kept on planting, the results we were expecting did not materialize immediately. I struggled with the thought. I was discouraged, and in my quiet time, I had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with God. Pouring out my heart to Him, I told Him, Lord, You trained and equipped me for this. The CCF mission, uh, vision, and the main ministry, which is the D-group, are very clear to me. Why isn't anything happening? By His grace, however, we kept on going and trusting the rest to the Lord. I told myself, as the song says, even if no one joins me, still I will follow. And so we just kept on doing what we were trained and called to do. After manning the fort in Cebu for almost seven years, I received a call from CCF Maine telling me that the leadership has decided to relocate us to Cagayan de Oro to help the ministry there. Early on in my Christian life, God has given me the grace to take His word seriously so that submitting to authority was actually not a major problem. But while it was okay with us, it was a different story with regards to our two daughters. I was bringing Melissa, our youngest, to school when I got the call, and she was shocked when he, she heard me say, Okay. I shared the news to my wife. She paused for a while, and being the great encourager that she is, she said, This is nothing less than coming from the Lord. Maybe God wants to expand our borders and do it in that area too. Later in the day, we broke the news to our other daughter, Grace, who worked in FEBC Cebu. I said, Anna, we have good news for you. We will be relocated to Cagayan de Oro. Her smile turned into a frown, shocked of what we said. And then she cried, knowing our lives will be very different from then on. We allowed our daughter to process her emotions with the Lord on her own. By God's grace, we know our children very well because we were given the privilege by the Lord to apply biblical parenting in their formative years. They see firsthand how we love and serve the Lord because they serve with us in ministry consistently through the years. They are serving in CCF Cebu faithfully. Without us in Cebu is proof enough for us that they love the Lord. God's call prevailed and we will only tell Him our lives with our children are given to you. Please take good care of them while we are far from each other. My wife and I had peace. We were confident the Lord will always be with them. In July 2007, we moved to CDO and we were welcomed warmly by the leadership there. The working conditions were great by the grace of God. Since the leaders who were my fellow members of the Council of Servants of COS were running their own businesses or practicing their own profession, I was tasked to run the day-to-day -day activities of CCF CDO at the same time overseeing another satellite. We have been in CDO for over 15 years now, and by God's grace, there is now a total of nine satellites in the North Main Hub, CCF CDO, we have Malaybalay, Iligan, Manolo Fortis, Dipolo, Butuan, Osamis, Valencia, and our pandemic satellite, CCF CDO Uptown, which was declared a satellite last September 1, 2021. The South Main Hub has four satellites, CCF Davao, 
Matina, Tagum, and Jensen. The church planting in Mindanao is a joint effort of our D12s and the men of peace that God provided. We are praying for at least seven more new satellites in the North Mindanao Hub and at least six more new satellites in the South Mindanao Hub in the next three years, Lord willing. God has grown CCF Cebu also for the past years and has provided a gorgeous center to cater for its growing ministry. We are looking at at least five more new satellites in Metro Cebu alone, not to mention the whole of the Visayas. As we look back to the many years of past, that simple first step of faith, God's work through CCF had expanded its borders to many areas in Mindanao and Visayas. This is a first-hand experience of how God can do wonders in our midst as long as we humbly obey Him and His Word and respond to His call. We consider it a privilege that our great and awesome God led us to Mindanao. We are committed to join Him where He is moving while we still can. It was by God's wisdom that led our leaders to relocate us to Cagayan de Oro, or CDO. There are no regrets. In fact, we are full of gratefulness of what God has done so far, and still full of excitement of what He will do next. The move was not easy, but God has shown Himself always good and faithful. He has sustained us, pruned us, empowered us, and never gave up on us. To God be all the glory, honor, and praise. I am very blessed when I think of Joseph. You may not know the background here. To be the founder of CCF Cebu and then to be taken out and transferred to another satellite is never easy because when you are transferred, he was transferred, but he was not the number one guy in Mindanao, in Cagayan. He was not number two. He was not even number three. For some people, that's insulting. But look at his testimony. He had such a positive attitude because he trusted in God and he obeys God one step at a time, like Joseph, one step at a time. Today, the work in Mindanao is amazing. They have over a thousand small groups, almost 3,000 members, and in Cebu, where he left, by the grace of God, Cebu is also over two, 3,000 people Lots of small groups. What am I saying? You want God's best? Yes or no? Louder. Yes. How do you have God's best? Understand. It's by grace. you got to respond properly. Trust and obey. Look at the closing quotation I want you to read in the comment of Henry Blackaby. Look at this quotation, everybody. God commands are designed to guide you to life's very best. You will not obey Him if you do not believe Him and trust Him. You cannot believe Him if you do not love Him. And you cannot love Him unless you know Him. My friends, God loves you. He wants what's best for you. Have you surrendered your life like Mary? Mary said, I'm your slave. Do to me whatever you want. Have you done that? Let's bow our heads. If you have never, ever surrendered your life completely like Mary, trusting in God. I'm not saying trusting God does not mean you will not be afraid. But the fact is you are trusting God and leaving the consequences to Him. How many of you would like to surrender your life completely, just like Mary, to Jesus today? With your heads bowed down. Raise your hand. Praise God. I want you to pray this prayer with me, okay, wherever you are. Raise your hand higher, okay, and keep them up as you pray this prayer. It's a life of surrender, okay? You follow this in your heart as we pray. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you, just like Mary. I will completely trust you. I am your bond slave. Do to me however you want it, whenever you want it. Lord, here I am. Give me the faith to trust you. Give me the faith to obey you. Lord Jesus, I pray for these men and women who have raised their hands. Make yourself real in their lives. And Lord, 
help us to anticipate your best. Your best may not be now, it may be future, but whatever it is, remind us, Lord, we trust you, you are faithful, and you will accomplish your purpose in my life as we surrender, as we walk with you. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.